Uh, my name is Roger Schmidt. It's my privilege to be uh, the pastor of the Highland Church here. And um, Steve Severance, where are you? Wave at me, Pastor Steve. Uh, my associate pastor, he's in the back. Come out here and wave your hand at us, Pastor Steve. That's uh, Pastor Steve. He's uh, works with us here as well, along with many, many, many other wonderful people. So we're glad you're here tonight. And uh, let me make a few short announcements. I know you didn't come to hear me talk, but uh, I do want to make you aware of a few things. First of all, we do have a uh, children's program. I'm sure you already know that, but that's taking place over to my left, your right. Um, there's a registration process there, parents. That's for nine and under. And uh, so please take full advantage of that if you need that. There's also some hearing assistance uh, if you need that. Um, if you need it, you might need your neighbor to tell you what I just said. Um, but anyway, we have some hearing assistance. Uh, just let, uh, let the guys know out in the lobby, and they'll set you up for that. Uh, please, um, as much as you love taking your, your phone calls, but once the preaching starts, let's, uh, let's silence our cell phones tonight and uh, keep our focus right where it should be, right in the Word of God. So uh, I appreciate your help on that. You did, um, I, I, I could tell that you are helping us with registration. I'm holding a registration card here. This is more helpful than you know. Please take the time each evening when you come out to the meetings to stop by the table and, uh, you know, uh, let Anna know that you're here. And uh, it'll become very streamlined, I promise, but it is helpful for us. It's helpful for you. If we have to make any adjustments with the schedule, we know how to get a hold of you. And also, if you come out night after night, we have some, um, you know, we have some rewards for that. There's a, a DVD set that we give out. I think it's seven nights if you come. Um, you're entitled to that. And so, anyway, uh, please uh, uh, take the time to do that. I know you will, so thank you for that. Also, you'll notice at the registration table, there is a Q&A box. I'm really excited about the Q&A box. Uh, any questions you have uh, about what you're hearing in the presentations, any Bible question at all, anything that you've heard and wondered, uh, put that question into, just write it out, put it right there in the box, and uh, Dakota will take some time to answer those questions as we go through. Uh, it's a great thing to take advantage of. So um, try to stump the evangelist. So that's what we're, we're going to say. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for, for helping us with that. Um, tonight's a very special night. We have some, some guests with us, some musical guests. We're so proud to have uh, Ryan Day and Tim Pardons. Why don't you guys wave uh, from where you're sitting there. They're here tonight. They're going to bring us some, some music. And uh, they're actually going to present a full concert tomorrow morning right in this building. And we usually do some preliminaries around 1045, but around 11 o'clock. If you're here in your seat by then, you'll be, you'll be able to hear that full concert. So I'd love to have you come out for that tomorrow. And they're also going to be presenting some music tomorrow night. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here and uh, braving the roads from, you, from where? Southern Illinois. Southern Illinois. Well, welcome to God's country. We're glad you're down here. It's excellent. All right. So I'll let them, uh, they'll talk to you here in just a little bit. Uh, tomorrow's meeting is going to be at 6 p.m., the evening meeting. Uh, grab one of these on the way out. We've got plenty of these flyers. Invite a friend if, if, if you're enjoying what you're hearing. Um, take one or two of these and give it to a, to a, a friend at work, uh, a relative, a neighbor, whoever. Uh, bring somebody out. You'll be glad you did, and they'll be happy that you invited them too. There's, there's going to be a, a blessing in each of these nights. So um, let's see, restrooms on either side. I think uh, you've probably already found that out. Um, I think we're ready to begin. Uh, Dakota, why don't you come on up? Let me introduce you to, to uh, Dakota Day, a speaker for Amazing Facts Television. Let's give him a hand. All right, yes. Uh, you're going to be hearing from him just a moment, but, uh, you know, I, I just want to take a moment to ask mm -hmm. you uh, a little bit about Amazing Facts, the Ministry of Amazing Facts. Tell us something about that. Yeah, so Amazing Facts started as a radio and television program in 1965 by a man by the name of Joe Cruz. He had a, a, a mission to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Lord ended up blessing that ministry so much that it turned into a media program where we are reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through lots of uh, means of the media. Uh, and so we're on TBN, we're on uh, USA Channel, Lifetime Channel, lots of History Channel. We're on lots of different programming. Uh, earlier in the mornings, if you want to know when our broadcast is, it's probably around 5 or 6 o'clock, depending on what time zone you're in. And you can see our broadcast on there. 
And so, yeah, yeah, Amazing Facts is reaching the world. How many of you have seen the Amazing Facts uh, program on television? Raise your hand up nice and high. So, okay, you're All already right. familiar with Amazing Facts Ministries. Good and there's also a um, you know, website ministry that they do. And, of yes. course, live events, which is what we're participating in here. So thank you so much. Now, yes. uh, just in case you think that Dakota just is doing something unusual by being here through the month of February, he travels with his wife all over the place doing these meetings. Where were you at last before you came to us here? Just came from northwest Nebraska in a little town called Shadron. I don't know. Anyone ever heard of Shadron? <laughs> all right. Good deal. Yes. Well, northwest Nebraska. Yes. That's and, where we came from. And I suspect after you're done here in February, at the end of February, do you have another meeting waiting for you? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be going to Louisiana after this. So down in Cajun country. It's going to be fun. Well, isn't that kind of where you come from? Uh, that, yeah. I'm actually from Arkansas, you're from believe Arkansas. it or not. Yeah, oh, I yeah. believe it, I believe it. All right. Well, not, you're... not that far down south, but right next door to you guys here. Well, if it's not <laughs> Tennessee, I'm not sure it counts anyway, but that's okay. We'll, we'll let that go. But uh, we're so glad you're here tonight. Yes. And I yes. know you're going to share a lot uh, uh, about, about your, your ministry with us. And, and you know, it, it, in, this, in this day and age, we need people mm -hmm. to share the good news of Jesus. So Amen. thank you for coming and being willing to do that. It's my let pleasure. Me, let me pray for you, then we'll let the gentleman sing us a song, and then we'll get started. Let's bow All our right. heads together. Lord, I want to ask that you would bless our time together tonight. I want to thank you for, for bringing us all out here on a, on a cold night. And uh, we're here because we believe in you. And we believe that you have something to say to us through your word. And so we would pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would be here with us, would speak through Dakota as he unlocks these, uh, these wonderful prophecies. And we talk about the, the, um, the urgency of the Bible message for this day and age. I pray that our hearts would be receptive to what you have to say. So we give this time to you, Lord, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Dakota technically didn't say it right. We're from Arkansas. Uh, it's a blessing to be here at the Highland Seventh-day Adventist Church. A uh, blessing to be able to participate in the opening of this event. And I promise you, my friends, you're going to be blessed because this event is all about Jesus. That's who we need to be looking to in these last days. Amen? We're going to sing about him right now. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in
Thank you, Ryan and Tim. What a blessing, amen? Amen. Amen. I got the privilege to grow up with Ryan. He is my brother, for those of you that do not know that. And uh, man, I got to hear some of the greatest concerts from the shower that you've ever heard in your entire life. Uh, We were visiting a while back and he was singing. And I told Stephanie, his wife, I said, man, I said, you know, anyone else would be like paying to hear this right now. He said, I get to hear it for free every day. <laughs> so praise God. Thank you, Ryan and Tim. It's a pleasure to have you guys with us. All right, guys. Well, we're very excited to have you with us tonight. We are going to be studying the Bible in such an amazing way. We're going to be going through uh, the Chronicles of Prophecy, and we're going to be unpacking Bible prophecy in a chronological form as we go throughout this entire series. We're going to be stopping along the way throughout that uh, chronological uh, series that we're going to be doing And we're going to be unpacking about some of the greatest deceptions of the devil and how you and I can be better prepared for the soon coming of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, we're so glad to have you with us. Uh, I just want to make an announcement here, something that I want to ask you to do. And I hope that you guys don't have a problem with this. Uh, I hope that you could bring your Bible every single night of this evangelistic series. Uh, Some people say, well, I don't have an actual Bible. If you don't have an actual Bible and you need a Bible, we would be glad to get you a Bible. You just come let me know and we can get you a Bible. Uh, But my guess is that you at least have one of these things with you here tonight. We do encourage that you silence these things, but I guarantee you, you have a Bible on your phone. If you don't have a Bible on your phone, you can go to the App Store right now and download one on your cellular device so that you might be able to follow along with us. Uh, This is a Bible prophecy seminar. And so we want to encourage you to bring your Bible every night and follow along with it. Now, one thing I've noticed when I go to many different churches in Christendom and in Christianity, a lot of people make the mistake of just trusting and believing whatever the minister says because he might look like he knows what he's talking about, right? But my friends, listen, there is too much at stake for you to be putting your trust in any religious leader, no matter if you think you know them or you don't know them, there's too much at stake. Can we say amen to that? We want to make sure that we're putting our trust in God and His Word. And so I want to encourage you throughout this series. I'm going to say this, and this is something I really want you to do. Do not trust me. Amen? 
I'm going to say that again. I think that's worthy of another amen. Do not trust me. Amen. Trust the Bible. My friends, again, there's too many people saying, oh, I know Pastor Bob. Pastor Bob's a good man. And Pastor Bob, he wouldn't lead me astray. You know, I play golf with Pastor Bob. And, and he was my, you know, he was my uh, teacher growing up all the way through school. Well, beloved, listen, we're not, we're, not, we're not questioning the people's sincerity, but you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Can we say amen to that one? All right, so I want to encourage you guys, bring your Bible every single night and follow along with us because we're going to be going through a journey together. And the only way you're not going to know, the uh, only way you're going to know, rather, that you are seeing and believing the truth for yourself is to follow along in the Bible. Now, for the most part, we're going to have the Scriptures on the screen every night. But there are going to be those times where I encourage you to open up your Bible and read it straight from your Bible with me. Can you guys do that for me tonight? All right, praise the Lord. All right. Well, our topic tonight is titled, The Inception of Deception. And uh, we're going to be looking at the beginning of some of the greatest, de what, how deception itself came into existence, and how really the, the origin of evil took place, this great controversy between Christ and Satan, between these two you know, opposing views, these two definitely interesting characters that we see has been playing out all throughout the 66 books of God's Word, and even into today's society today. So uh, before we dive into this presentation, I want to encourage you to bow your heads, and let's go to God in prayer. And ask Jesus to be with us tonight. Father in heaven, we want to say thank you, Lord, so much for your faithfulness. Lord, so much for your love and your grace and, of course, your mercy. We pray tonight, Lord, that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your word says to us. And, Lord, that we will take this truth tonight that we hear. And the lessons, Lord, that you want us to learn from it, apply it to our lives. That we will not just be hearers of your word, but the Father, we will be doers. And we ask that your Holy Spirit be present with everybody, want everybody here tonight and everybody that might be watching this uh, over the airwaves and that might be watching this in the future. Lord, that you will convict our hearts. Help us to walk out of these doors closer to you tonight than what we were when we came in. And that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would be filled in our hearts and minds. We will truly be transformed into your image and be better prepared for your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The inception of deception. Now, the book of Revelation is a book that is, cannot, be re, uh, cannot be read chronologically. Uh, now, this is the Chronicles of Prophecy seminar, right? So we're going to be going through literally a chronological order of how the events are going to be taking place in Bible prophecy. Now, but before we can do that, before we can really make sense of all of that, we have to understand how to read the Bible. The Bible was not written chronologically, nor was the book of Revelation written chronologically. It's actually written what I like to call thematically. It was written in themes. And so when you read the Bible, especially when you read Revelation, you can't just read it from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22 and think that you're going to be able to understand it all in a chronological element because it's not going to make sense. So if you've ever watched any movies or out there in Hollywood, you probably have heard of the Star Wars films. Anyone heard of those films? I'll never forget when I was a kid growing up watching the Star Wars films, I was totally confused because the, the Star Wars films are, are be t tells the story, the beginning of the story at the end and tells the end of the story first. And so it's really confusing. You can't really watch the ones that came out in the 70s and the 80s and then get an understanding of, of everything in a chronological element. So likewise, the Bible tells the very beginning of the story at the last of the book, how, the, how everything really took place between this great controversy between Christ and Satan. And we're going to see that as we unpack it. But before we do, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. We're going to see something very powerful here in Revelation chapter 1. A lot of people are confused about the Bible. They don't understand. They, they, they are deceived by the devil in thinking that they cannot understand the Bible, cannot understand God's Word. And so in Revelation chapter 1, notice what this book is all about. Notice Revelation. The word Revelation means to reveal. It's revealing. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says, The revelation of whom? Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, listen. When I was growing up in Christianity, a lot of people would tell us, oh, don't worry about that book of Revelation. You know, that book's a closed book. Nobody really understands that book anyways. And there's no possible way we can understand all of the, the details of that book. And, and I remember hearing answers like, you know, oh, well, you know, if you love Jesus, that's all that matters, you know, and your relationship with Jesus is the most important. Well, that's very true. You do want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But notice what the book of Revelation is all about. Notice what this book, or who, rather, this book is revealing. What does it say, Revelation 1.1? It's the revelation, the revealing of whom? Jesus Christ. So do you think we need to get to know this book? You better believe it, my friends. And we are going to be unpacking the profundity and the beauty of this book throughout this entire series. Uh, but look at verse 3. How many of you like blessings? Show of hands. How many of you like blessings? All right, I love blessings. Well, notice what verse 3 says. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at what? 
The time is at hand. So if you like blessings, beloved, the Bible says, Blessed are he that, the he that readeth, he that hear the words of this prophecy, and keeps those things written therein. The time is at hand. So if you like blessings, you're in the right place, because we're going to be unpacking a lot of the beauty of the book of Revelation in this entire series that we're going to have over the month of February. Now, I just want to encourage you to keep coming every single night because these presentations are going to build one upon the other. So if you miss one, that's all right. We'll catch you up on that. But make sure you keep coming when you can. Amen? Amen. Amen. The book of Revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But the book of Revelation covers the beginning of the story, the beginning of, of literally the creation of what took place even before, even before the creation of the world, even before the creation of Adam and Eve. And, and we read about this interesting event that took place in chapter 12 of Revelation. Notice verse 7. It says, And there was war in heaven. Wow. Interesting that it says there's war in heaven. Now, beloved, when you think of heaven, do you think of war? Do you think of like guns and, and ammunition and fire, you know, firing weapons and swords and all of this? Is that what you think of when you think of heaven? Do you think of warfare? No, not at all, beloved. Now, if I said Iraq, you probably think war. You probably think AK-47s, M-16s, RPGs, right? But if I said Afghanistan or, or the Middle East or something like that, that's what you're probably going to think of. You're going to think of war. But my friends, notice it says there was war in heaven. When you think of heaven, you certainly don't think of a place where war is going to be breaking out. But this is what's so beautiful about this whole situation is that this book actually refers to how the beginning of, of evil began. How, how the entrance or the inception of deception began. And it began with a warfare. Now this word war in the original Greek, now the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek. In the original Greek, the word war means the word polemos, polemos. Now, that word polemos is actually where we get the word taking a poll from, or where we would also get the word politics. How many of you like you some good old politics out there? <laughs> Woo, put your hands down, put your hands down. All right, now here, look, we get the word politics here. Now, when you think of politics, what do you think of? War. Can we say amen? That's exactly what you think of, right? You think of the two you know, diametrically opposed parties, right? The Republicans and the Democrats. And let me tell you something, beloved. I don't care if you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. We're not here to talk politics tonight. I don't care if you're a Republican or if you're a Demublican. It makes me no difference. Amen? We're not talking about politics here tonight, but what we are talking about is how this war began and what this war really was. It wasn't like, you know, the, the enemy Satan decided, you know, he's going to pull out his big guns on God and try to blow God away with his angelic proverbial in 60s. This is not what's taking place here. It's not a war against guns, a war, a war on violence, so to speak. It's not who's got the bigger nuclear warhead. It's not about that. This is a war of ideas. The word war here is, again, the word polemos. It means politics. It's actually where we get our word in the English language, which is polemic. If someone is polemic, what are they? They're argumentative, right? They, they, they love arguments. They love debating. They, they love that contention. Well, this is what happened in heaven, and this is what happened at the very beginning. It says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And so notice what it goes on to say here, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So there was, this, there was this warfare that broke out, a war of ideas that led to a physical removal of the, of the other party. God, where God has to ultimately remove the other party or cast out, as we're about to see in this text, the other party, which was representative of the devil and Satan. Notice it says here, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Now, a lot of people, when they study Revelation, they make the mistakes of applying their own understanding, their own you know, cognitive concepts to, to things. When people see the dragon, they immediately go, oh, China. But it doesn't say China. Who does it say the dragon represents, beloved? Satan, the devil and Satan, right? And so we've got to let the Bible interpret itself, or otherwise we will get the wrong teaching, the wrong concept, and we will be deceived. We've got to let the Bible interpret itself. So it says here, the dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the where? Into the earth. So, so this warfare took place... Right along the time frame that the earth was about to be created. Remember the earth was created? Adam and Eve was, was created there in Genesis chapter 2. And, and as everything was unpacking, then we see there's this short conflict in Genesis 3 between the serpent, right? Between the devil and, and, and of course, Adam and Eve, humanity. And so here it says here, they were cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now notice what it says here. The devil had some angels, he had some people that was joining him in his war or his, his war of ideas. He had some people that was on his side that, that joined his 
political party, if you will. And they were cast out of heaven. It says his angels were cast out with him. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. It says this, For the accuser of our brethren is what? Cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. What is it calling Satan here? It's calling him the accuser of the what? Of the brethren. Now, beloved, listen. An accuser, what, what kind of things does an accuser make? They make something. What do they make? Accusations. Accusations, right? Now, can an accusation be true? Yes. Can an accusation also be false? Yes, absolutely. And so he, he was kicked out of heaven. This verse in verse 10 gives us more detail as to why Satan was kicked out of heaven. He was kicked out because of his accusations. He was making these accusations against God. He became an accuser. And so we're going to see as we keep reading on what these accusations were that Satan had made against God. It goes on to say, though, about those whom Satan attacks. And they overcame him by the blood of the what? Woo, come on, somebody got to get excited about that. By the what? The blood of the Lamb. Now, beloved, if you haven't heard the gospel story, tonight you will hear the gospel story. You're going to hear the good news of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you here tonight. I'm not even going to hide it from you. If you're not a Christian in here tonight and you don't believe in Jesus Christ, I'm after you. I'm, I want you to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Not because I, uh, I have been believing this by blind faith. Not because I was raised up in Christianity. Not because I, I, I just was told that this was the truth. No, 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 no. Not at all. I want you to believe, be a believer in Jesus Christ, beloved, because I have read this book and it has astronomically changed my life forever. Are you with me? It has absolutely changed who I am and everything about me. And it's continuing to change me. And so I can tell you this, my friends, it's a change for the better. And so I hope and pray that if you're here tonight, that you will give my Lord a chance. And by the end of this whole series, if you give, if you give the study a chance, if you give this, this seminar a chance and give God's Word a chance, you will have happiness and joy and peace that the Bible says surpasses all understanding. Are we together, beloved? You know, I, I love it when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. He penned the words down to life liberty, and what is it? The pursuit of what? Happiness. Isn't that what we're all after? Happiness. Don't we all just want to be happy? You better believe it, my friends. We all want to be happy. Well, I have discovered that there is only one fountain of which happiness flows through, and it's Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I hope that you can discover that for yourself as well. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. So there's a woe. Now when you see a woe in Revelation, what it's talking about is watch out. And you know what? You almost fall down. What do you say? Woe. Right? Watch out, it says. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. That's you and I, beloved. Why? It says, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So there's this warfare. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought on his angels. There's this warfare between two, again, political views, two political parties, if you will, in heaven. This, this politics broke out in heaven, and it created this warfare where there was this physical removing of Satan from heaven. He's cast out of heaven, and he's cast into the what? What did Revelation say? He's cast into the earth. I'll never forget when I read that. I thought, well, why, oh, why, God, would you cast him down here? Maybe you thought that. Maybe you were wondering that. Why, God, would you, bring, would you cast Satan down here? Well, there is a reason behind all of this in which we're going to be looking at the profundity of and the details of tonight. Now, we talked about how Satan is known in Revelation in chapter 12 as the accuser, right? So this begs the question, what accusations has Satan made against God? Well, we get more details of this when we read about the other passages of Satan in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 14. God quotes what Lucifer was thinking in his mind. Notice what it says. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? I love how Isaiah forms this in a question. How? You ever thought about that for a moment? He was created, all of the angels were created, obviously, and he was created in a perfect environment. There was no such thing as sin because Satan was the originator of sin. There was no such thing as, as rebellion. There was no such thing as, as anything bad. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? I'll never forget, I was giving a Bible study to a 10-year-old little girl. Her name, was, her name was Bethany. And Bethany, as I was giving this Bible study to her, she said, but Brother Dakota, she always called me, Brother Dakota, 
She said, how did he fall from heaven? Wasn't heaven perfect? And I said, that's a good question, Bethany. That's, that's right. Heaven was perfect. I said, we're going to look at that. And we're going to answer that question, how Satan fell from heaven. We're going to look at the, the details of that in just a bit. It says, it calls him the son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? And then it says this. For thou hast said in thine heart. So this is God quoting Lucifer and what he saw him saying inside his heart. Quote, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the what? The most high. So what do we see happening here? Satan is saying, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Well, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, in fact, in fact, turn there with me in your Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, you'll get an idea of what Satan is saying here, because it made it sound weird. What, stars of God? What, what is that? Go with me to Revelation 12. We're going to look at verse 4. Revelation 12, verse 4, it says, And his tail, remember it's speaking of the dragon, and the dragon in verse 9 is referencing Satan. So notice what it says here in verse 4. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Now let's stop. His tail drew one-third of the stars of heaven. Now go with me in Revelation 1.20. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Turn there with me in your Bible. Revelation 1, verse 20. And let's read what the stars of God represent. Revelation 1, verse 20. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the seven stars are representative of what? Angels. Are you with me so far, beloved? So when it says his tail in Revelation 12, 4, drew one third of the stars of God. Remember, when he was cast out in Revelation, it says that he was cast out of heaven and his angels were cast out with him. So it says the devil's tail, the dragon's tail, drew one third of the stars of God. This representative of, of one third of the host of the angels of heaven was deceived by Satan's accusation against the character of God from heaven. Now, I found it interesting that it says his tail drew one-third. It's not speaking literally as, Satan is a, as if Satan is a literal dragon. No, 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 no. It's speaking of it as a symbolic. Now, when you think about it, what's another word for tail? A lie, right? When, when somebody tells a lie, what do they say? Oh, did you hear that tall tale that he told? Right? Satan's tail drew one-third. Of the stars of God. This is speaking again of the angels of God. And so he's saying, I, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend above you know, the, thro the throne of God and the stars of God, he says. I'm going to be up there. And if you notice in every single one of these sentences where he's saying this, he's saying, I, I will do this. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. What's Satan's problem? He's pride. He's focused on himself. What's the middle letter in the word sin? I. This, the, the central focus in the, in the letter itself is I. What's the middle letter in the word pride? I. It's all about you. It's all about what you do, right? Selfishness at the core is ultimately sin. Are you guys with me so far? And so, so he says this, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, Satan did not want to be like God, like you and I want to be like God, right? We want the character of God, do we not? I don't know about you. I want to be like Jesus. How many of you want to be like Jesus out there? I want to be loving and kind and benevolent. I want to have the, the fruit of the Spirit of God. And so Satan was not wanting to be like God in that sense, but Satan was wanting to take the position of God. Are you seeing this so far? Now, now, when you look at the details of this, what this is saying, this is an accusation in and of itself. Let's say, for, for instance, that, that you owned your own successful company, and this was a multi-million dollar company, and it was your company. And I'm an employee of your company. And, and I, I come along and I, I start gaining influence with all the employers and, and the board of your company. I start, you know, I start rubbing shoulders with the board members and everybody's starting to like me real good. I'm, I'm kind of like that Absalom figure. I'm kind of like that guy everybody's really liking, right? And, uh, and as I start rubbing shoulders with everybody, you know, I start basically saying to everybody, you know, I think I should be really the, the, the CEO of this company. By me saying that, what am I accusing you of? of being unworthy to be the CEO of that company. Are you guys following me? Raise your hand if this is making sense so far. Everyone with me? Okay, good deal. So what we see from this is that Satan, by saying this, I will be like the Most High, he's wanting to take the position and the throne of God. Therefore, he is actually saying and accusing God of being a God that is unworthy of his position and unworthy of worship. Now, 
Ezekiel chapter 28 gives more insight on this detail. It says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Now let's stop there for a moment. A lot of people think this passage is talking about the king of Tyre. It's not talking about the king of Tyre, because notice what it says. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Speaking of the garden of Eden. Only four individuals was biblically described being in the garden of Eden. That was Adam, Eve, God, and who else? The serpent himself, which is the devil, right? So this is speaking of one of those individuals, and we know it's speaking of Satan. It says here, every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So in these passages, you know what we're understanding about Satan? is He was beautiful. It says, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee at the day that thou was created. It says that every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the carbuncle, and the gold. You ever heard how Satan's one of the most beautiful angels God ever created? You ever heard that? Where did we get that from? Ezekiel 28. And then you, you read this scripture here. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. We ever heard that Satan was, was, a, was a beautiful singer? You ever heard that before? Ah, where did we get that from? Right here in this passage. You know, when somebody can sing really well, like Ryan and Tim, you know what they say about those guys? They got a set of pipes on them. Can we say amen? amen. Satan had a set of pipes on him. And he uses it and even manipulates music and things to get people to do his bidding. Are you following me? So he's very deceptive, very cunning. And notice what he goes on to say here. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, when you go and read Exodus chapter 25, it gives more details about what a cherub is. A cherub was an actual covering angel that would cover the Ark of the Covenant. It was a golden angel that would cover the Ark of the Covenant right next to God's throne. That was patterned according to Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. It was patterned, the, the Old Testament sanctuary was patterned after the heavenly sanctuary. You guys following me? So, this is indication here. This Satan was one of the angels closest to God's throne. Are you following me here? Wow. And if you do some research, you'll find out it's always those people that's the closest to the throne that's always wanting to overthrow the king on the throne. Are you following me? Uh-huh. And so, my friends, Satan was one of the covering cherubs. He was close to God's throne. He says, God says, I have said thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. The Bible refers to God's presence as a consuming fire. Right? He walked in the midst of God's presence. It says here, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till what? Till iniquity was found in thee. Now this is key that we understand this verse. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now let me ask you this question here. Did God create a devil? Think about it for a moment. When I was a kid growing up in Christianity, you know, going to many different churches in Christendom and studying with many different churches, my family had a music ministry, so we would travel and go to many different places, and we got to hear a lot of different faiths, beliefs, and, and study with many different churches in the Christendom today. And I'll tell you, beloved, that there's a lot of people that's teaching that God created this little red man, you know, dressed in a red leotard outfit with horns and a pitchfork, and he gave him the pitchfork and said, oh, now go get him. Is that what God created according to the verse that we just read? No, not at all. Check it out. Notice what it says. Thou wast, what's that word? Perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Notice, till iniquity was, what's that word? Found in thee. So notice, God did not put sin or put iniquity in Satan to make him his henchman to go about punishing people who sin. No, 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 not at all. Notice what happened is that he found iniquity in Satan. This indicates something very significant about this conflict between Christ and Satan that you and I need to understand. It indicates that Satan had a choice in the matter. Are we together so far? Making sense so far? Satan had a choice in the matter because God did not put iniquity in him. God made him perfect. God found iniquity in the devil. Now, if God did not create a devil, this little red man dressed in a red leotard outfit, then how did Satan become evil? Well, that's a good question. Well, I like to answer this by describing 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. What does the Bible say about God? God is, what's that word? Love. Now, be no, notice here, beloved, it doesn't say here that God is merely just loving. That would be an adjective describing a mere, a mere trait, quality, or characteristic. But it describes Him as a love. He is love. Now, you and I can be loving one moment, but then we can be hateful the next moment. Isn't that right? 
But see, you and I wouldn't describe each other as saying that you are love. You just don't hear that kind of terminology being talked about because we understand that's not actually accurate with humanity, right? Our, the Bible says our hearts are sinful and desperately wicked. Are we together, beloved? But God is love. 1 John 4 and 8 makes that very clear. Now here's something you want to understand about love. Love demands freedom. Love demands freedom. Freedom and love, if you separate freedom from, from, from a relationship, then you don't have real love. Let me, let me give an illustration here. Think about it this way. Let's imagine for a moment... I had the privilege to go to Honolulu, Honolulu, Hawaii in 2017 and 18 and to preach some evangelistic meetings. Let's imagine for a moment you and I are going to take a trip in Vaikiki Beach in Honolulu, Hawaii. So we're on Vaikiki Beach and as we're walking along the beach, oh, we're enjoying this beautiful sunset. Oh, it's so beautiful. And we look up about 100 yards or so and we see this beautiful wedding ceremony. The minister's there and he has his Bible open from a distance and, and the, the groom is in his tuxedo Nice tuxedo. The bride is in her beautiful, bright, white dress. And, and you know, as we're walking there, you're like, oh, that's so sweet. Look at them. A, a sunset, a sunset wedding on Honolulu, Be Honolulu Beach. This is amazing. This is awesome. You may nudge your honey and say, why couldn't we do that, right? And then, and then as you get a little bit closer in our walk along the beach, we get walk a little bit closer to this couple and we see that the groom has a gun held to his bride. And he's saying, you better say yes. And he's pointing at the minister saying, you better keep reading. And you better say yes. And you better keep reading. How many of us would look at that and go, ooh, that's some true love. Anybody do that? Do this right here. No, you ain't going to do that. You know why you're not going to do that? Because you know good and well, she's only marrying the guy because she's being forced to. It's not freedom. It's not free will. Are we together, beloved? Making sense? So, so listen, God is love. So if God would have made you and I and pre-programmed you and I to be able to do all of His bidding and do everything that it is possible, right, that He wants us to do so that we'll never make a mistake and we'll never do anything wrong, well, then that's not true love. Because we would only be serving Him because we're programmed to do that. Are you guys following me? But it's a, it's a beautiful and amazing thing when you really unpack the profundity of what God did. I like what C.S. Lewis communicated in, in, in him unpacking this idea. He said... He said, basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, it's a profound thing to think that God would make a, a, a creation in which would be his highest esteemed creation and yet give it the ability to not love him at all or to even hate him. Wow. Are you, we wouldn't do that, would we? Right? When we have a child, we don't have anticipation for that child to hate us. How many of you are with me? When you have a pet, you don't have anticipation for that pet to hate you. You're hoping that that child will love you, and you're hoping that your, your pet would love you too. Are you with me so far? And so God is love, and love demands freedom. And freedom, when it's given, the thing with freedom is that when it is given, it entails risk. Let me explain it to you this way. How many of you have teenagers out there, kids in general? Ah, if you don't have teenagers yet, that sweet little baby that you just had, oh, it's so sweet. Sweet little eyes and sweet little fingers. And guess what? It's going to turn into a teenager. <laughs> right? Sweet little baby. Right? And, and, and here's the thing. Beloved, listen. That, that sweet little baby, when it becomes a teenager, it's going to ask you. It's going to get to an age where it's going to start wanting freedom. It's going to start wanting more rope, more leash. And then eventually you're going to run out of rope and you're just going to have to you know, untie it. And it's going to have to go, and it's going to come to you one day and it's going to say, Mom, Dad, can I borrow the keys to go out on a night on the town with my friends? Go to Nashville. You're, you know that if you give the freedom to that little, you know, 15-year-old or 16-year-old, right, that, that's just got their license, what does that entail? Risk. Risk comes, right? And when risk comes, you know that that teenager can get out there and choose to go against everything that you have raised them to believe, everything that you've raised them to do, and to go against every single thing against your character and what you've taught them, right? They can get out there and get involved in drugs. They can get out there and, and end up stealing something, getting with the wrong crowd. They can end up getting hurt. There's all kind of risk involved. But if you love your child, are you with me? Eventually, at some point, you have to be able to give them freedom. Can we say amen? No doubt about it. So, so God is what? Love. And follow this process with me. Love demands, what does it demand? Freedom. And freedom, when it is given to someone, entails what? 
risk. Good job, good job. Now, risk requires something. It requires responsibility. But it doesn't require responsibility to, to the one who gives freedom. It requires responsibility. It requires responsibility to the one to whom freedom is given to. Are you following me? So if your teenager gets out there and robs a convenience store, who's going to end up in the back of the, uh, of the cop car? Is it going to be you or your teenager? It's going to be the teenager. Are you following me? So God created all of, of the host of heaven, all of the angels and their abundance. The Bible says thousands and thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. It's just amazing to think. We, we don't even, in other words, there's just so many of them. He makes all of them and then he makes humanity. <clears throat> and he made us with that free will of choice to choose to love him or to not love him, to serve him or to not serve him, to hate him or, or to you know, completely just fall in love with him immediately. Are you with me so far? And so, my friends, this is beautiful in a fact that God created us that way. So you, to answer the question, how did, how did Satan become evil? Well, it, it's, it's indicated in that, that verse before. it. God found iniquity in him. He chose with his own free will to exercise his own authority in going against the government of God and establishing, trying to establish his own political realm, a different political party that's different than the government of God. Are you with me so far? This happened in heaven, beloved. A place of beauty, a place of splendor. Now notice what Ezekiel goes on to say here in verse 17. I love this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Notice what it says. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Speaking of Satan still, because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So understand something. What's being said here is it's pretty amazing. Satan, what really caused him to become the way he was? To want the place of God was him looking at self. You ever met those kind of people? They're just all about themselves. Me, myself, and I. Right? You ever go shopping with those people? You go out shopping with them and you're like, do, do these pants make me look fat? And they're like, I don't know, but this looks like fabulous on me. You ever seen somebody like that? Yeah? And, and no matter what, they're all about themselves. Well, Satan was like that all the time. He, I can imagine him standing in front of, you know, if you've ever seen a three-way mirror, right? Him probably standing in front of the angelic three-way mirrors and he's probably like, woo, yeah. Ah. Uh. Look at me. I look, I'm so fine. Ooh, look how fine I am. I look good. You know, I'm so beautiful. I think maybe I should be worshipped. Are you with me? Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Lifted up because of thy beauty. The heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He looked to himself and it got to his head. Are you with me, beloved? Now, how is God going to deal with this accusation? Because Satan has made this accusation against God... Right? Against his character and against his government. How is he going to deal with this accusation? Satan has just rebelled in heaven. Right? Let's go through it. Satan has just rebelled in heaven. And as he's just rebelled in heaven, there's this, there's this polym polymos. There's this there's political warfare taking place in heaven. How does God deal with it? Well, immediately somehow from the very beginning of our existence in this world, from a child, we all recognize the significance of heroes. How many of you recognize some of these heroes here? Maybe you've seen them before in your childhood growing up, right? You have, you have Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and, 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 uh, and the Hulk, and, and these, these heroes that we see here, right? And so, so we, all, we all sense the idea when we're just being raised up as little toddlers, little, little bitty kids, we, we see these kind of programs and we sense the need in our own life and in the world of a hero. And this is why these films make so much money. While they're the number one, you know, film in the theaters every time they come up. You know why? Because the world itself is attracted to heroes. We are attracted. We are, we are so attracted to heroes. We, we know and sense that this world needs a hero. But there's an interesting way that these heroes go about saving everybody. The world needs a savior. So how do they go about doing it? They go about doing it through violence. And in fact, it's, this is a, a phrase that I, I, I've learned through... Uh, a couple of other minister friends of mine that called the myth of redemptive violence. It's this idea, it's this idea that, that what you have is that, you know, you have, a, you have a fire break out, you have something break out, you have a problem. Well, send an Iron Man through there and blow everybody away, blow away the enemy with his, you know, thrusters, and then you'll be able to what? You'll be able to overcome the, the, the violence and overcome that with violence. Are you with me so far? But my friends, do you fight fire with fire? Do this right here. No, you don't fight fire with fire, right? But we oftentimes say that, right? And you know, it's amazing because our God was so different. This is what made Jesus just so unique. 
He would say stuff like this. He would say, when someone hits you, turn to them your other cheek also. And I, I could imagine if I was a scribe or a Pharisee or somebody, I'd be like, Pfft. what? What? Turn to them your other cheek also. Because that's not what Captain America would do or, or Iron Man would do or Thor. Are you with me, beloved? What do we see them do? Retaliation, right? That if, if there's a problem, there's an issue, the heroes that we, we see on film today, they come in with this myth of redemptive violence that they're going to redeem the world, they're going to help the world to have true, you know, a saving redemption through violence itself. And, and, and could God have done that? Could God have just used violence and obliterated Satan out of existence? You know, like, who are you, you puny little ant to come up against me? Okay. Ant, meat, boot. I mean, problem solved, right? Why didn't, why didn't God just do that from the very beginning? That would have surely solved all of the problems, wouldn't it? No more Satan, no more Lucifer. We'd be a lot better off. When I first read the Bible, this is exactly what I thought as a young man. I thought, God, why don't you just take him out at the very beginning? Problem solved. Well, that's because we have this idea. The myth of redemptive violence in our minds. And that's how we generally think in our carnal and human nature. But my friends, our God is... What's that word? Love. How many of you, when your child disobeys you, you just tell them, you've got to die now? And you want to do that? No, you don't do that. You know why? Because you are loving to your child. Can we say Amen. You love your child. You love your children. You wouldn't do that if your dog comes and drops a douche right there in the middle of the floor. You're not just going to be like, okay, well, let's just go. They'll grab the gun. Go out back. You wouldn't say that and you wouldn't do that. Now, beloved, listen. You, are, you and I, the Bible says you and I are, 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 are corrupted. We're evil. Are you with me so far? Now, if you and I wouldn't do that, what makes you think a God that is love would do that? Are you following me? So... By the way, would that have solved the problem? Think about it. If God would have just squished him out of existence and said, okay, there you have it. Would that, would have, would that have solved the problem that Satan created in heaven? Yes or no? No, not at all. And here's why. It's easier to kill a person than it is an idea. Are you with me? See, what did Satan make? Satan had made an accusation against God by him saying that he, is, he ought to be God. He ought to be in God's place. He was ultimately saying God is unworthy of worship. And so if God would have just been like, okay, and just squashed him out of existence, then this would have furthered the accusation of the devil. This would not have helped God in any way. Are you with me so far? Because keep in mind, does God still love everyone else? Yes. So all of the other angels would have looked at this scenario and they would have been like, oh, you haven't, you haven't seen Lucifer around anywhere? Nobody's seen Lucifer? Huh. Are you with me? Maybe Lucifer was on to something and God didn't want us to know. You see, God is love. And so what does God do in this scenario? He doesn't solve this accusation by the myth of redemptive violence, by him coming through and blowing away the enemy. No, 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 no. That's not how he does it. Our God, our superhero, our Savior does it in such a more beautiful way. So how is God going to deal with this accusation? Well, let's take a look at verse 17 and keep reading. Check it out. Ezekiel 28, 17. This is how God solves the problem. This right here. This verse is God's problem-solving plan right here. I will cast thee to the ground, God says. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. That's how God's going to deal with this accusation. You say, what? Hold on a second. What? God's going to, he's going to solve this problem by laying Satan before kings that they may look at him? Absolutely. Absolutely. So who are these kings that God wanted to behold Satan? Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made who? Us, kings and priests unto God. Are you with me so far? So who are the kings? We are the kings. God says, listen, here's God's plan. I'm going to cast you, Satan, to the ground. Where did he cast him in Revelation? To the earth. Same thing in Old Testament. He casts him to the ground. And his plan to solve this accusation, I'm going to lay you before kings that they may behold thee. What does behold mean, beloved? 
to see, to look at you, right? In other words, what God's saying here in verse 17 of Ezekiel 28, He's saying, listen, I'm going to lay you before kings, before these kings, that they may see you for who you really are. Ooh, did you catch that? So now the accusation is going to be able to be just completely broken down and disproved. That this accusation that God is an unfair God, that He's unjust and that He's unworthy of worship, and that He's this you know, horrible God that doesn't deserve to be in His place, God's going to break that down by letting these kings behold Satan for who he really was. So Satan takes the challenge. Okay, we'll see. And now the, 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 the table is set, or you could say this way, the courtroom is set. Are you following me? Don't miss it. Notice Genesis 3, verse 1. Who was the first kings to behold Satan? It was Adam and Eve. Notice what it says in Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now understand what it just said there. He's more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. It doesn't say he's the most powerful. Are you with me? You know, I think too, too many times we give Satan too much power. Too much, we, we think of Satan more powerful than we do our God at times. There's so many people I've met in Christianity, they believe that Satan has more power to keep them in sin than God has power to save them from sin. Beloved, I don't know about you, but I have a God that's more powerful than my devil. Can somebody say amen out there? Amen. amen. Praise God. So it says he's more subtle. Hey, hey, it doesn't say he's more powerful. <laughs> no, not at all. He, he's more subtle than any He's more deceptive. This is the inception of deception. It started in heaven... And now we're seeing how it played out here on planet earth. He's more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He, he instills a question in her mind to cause doubt. And then notice what the woman says here. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, for the most part, did Eve know that she wasn't supposed to eat of the forbidden fruit? Yes or no? Yes, she knew God's word said, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die, right? And so she knew the word of God, but I got a question, was that enough to save her? Listen, beloved, if you're going to catch anything tonight, don't miss this. Listen, pay close attention to this. Don't, don't miss this one. You can know the rules and still fail in keeping them. Let me say it this way. You can know the rules and not know the ruler. You can know the doctrines and not know the doctor, you can know the Word of God and not know the God of the Word. Are you following me? There's a lot of people that makes this mistake. And so, so Eve, did she know the Word of God for the most part to not eat of the fruit? Yes, but that wasn't enough to save her. So now, since she doesn't know the God of the Word the way that she should, Satan's about to capitalize on his deception, on his subtlety. The serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Now, what is he accusing God of being by making this statement? Do we see an accusation? There's the accusation in heaven. God is unfit for, for judgment. God is unfit to be God. He's unfit to rule. And then the accusation comes down to humanity. You're not really going to die. And so what do you think Eve's thinking now? Huh. What do you mean I'm not going to die? And he goes on to say, For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, here's the thing. Did Adam and Eve know what good was? Do this right here. Uh-huh. They knew what good was, but did they know what evil was? Never had, never had they ever seen evil or experienced evil. So for all they knew, evil was better than good. Are you with me so far? So now Eve's sitting there and she's thinking, huh, oh, man. So God's withholding something from me. i got a question. Do you think God withholds something from you? Do this right here. Yeah, he does, and here's why. God, just like any parent, withholds things from you that's not good for you. Can we say amen? Right? You better believe it, beloved. How many of you are parents out there? How many of you withhold things from your children, not because you don't love them, but because you love them and you don't want them to experience that? Amen. So if God's withholding something from you, it's for your good. But he was telling them, don't do this, right? And when they came into the garden, there was a thousand yeses. Yes, you can eat that. Yes, 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 yes. But then there's this one no in the garden. But Satan had them believing that God's withholding you from this one because he doesn't want you to be like him. Again, like, oh, I can be like God? Oh, oh he, he, he's, he's really keeping me back. And so now what we have, and you know the story, 
Adam and Eve, they were supposed to see Satan for who he was. Are you with me? But instead, what did, what did they do? Instead of believing the word of God, they believed the word of the devil. They both took and they ate and sin entered the world. So let me share this with you. Sin is ultimately the result of a false picture of the character of God. Are you following me here tonight? Sin is ultimately the result of a false picture of the character of God. When the devil can get you to believe something false about God's character and who God is, then he can get you to partake in sin willfully because you think God is someone he's not. Are you with me so far? It's very important that when you read the Word of God, you don't read it just to get you know, informed, but you read it to get to know the God of the Word. Are you with me, beloved? Amen. So in a way, this is what God's plan was in this whole thing of casting them to the ground that they might behold Satan. This whole plan was for them to see Satan for who he really was. But what took place was that they were deceived again by the devil. And you would think at this point, God would just be like, okay, that's it. I've had enough. You know, pull out his angelic M60 and just boom, 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 and blow them all away. But our God is what? He's love. Ooh. We have an awesome God. He is love. And so instead of him doing that, he then says, okay, this is a perfect opportunity for me to show everybody not only the angels in heaven, but even humanity, who I really am. Come on now. Come on now. So what we have here is we have like a courtroom scene going on. Come on, in a courtroom, what do you have in a courtroom? What do you have in a courtroom? Who sits here on this side of the court? He's called the what? The plaintiff. And the plaintiff is the accuser. He's accusing the who? Who is he accusing over here? The defendant. And the defendant is defending himself and his character against the accusations of the plaintiff. So you have the plaintiff, the accuser, you have the defendant. In this courtroom, the, 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 the difference in this courtroom, the, the, the very, I guess you could say significant difference, difference in this courtroom scene between Christ and Satan is that the judge is the one who has been put on trial. Are you following me? So the judge has been put on trial, so now we have a dilemma. It's an unfair trial. So what does God do? I'm going to cast you to the ground. I'm going to lay you before who? Kings that they may what? Behold you. Who else is also present in a courtroom over to the side that's beholding the conflict between the plaintiff and the defendant? The jury. Are you guys following me? Now check this out. The jury gets to see all of the facts from both sides. So you could say it this way. The jury experiences both the plaintiff, the accuser, and gets to a chance to experience the defendant. Are you with me so far? Woo! How many is getting excited? Oh, you guys ain't getting excited on me? Do I need to sit down here and wait on you to get excited? <laughs> what do we have in this courtroom? We have what? We have a, an accuser, Satan. And then we have this, this jury that's beholding how this plaintiff is popping off at the mouth and making these accusations against the defendant, Jesus Christ. So Jesus, instead of Jesus, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, I, there's nothing I can do. I mean, I hope you guys believe me. No, 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 no. He gets up and he testifies on his own behalf. Are you guys following me? He testifies on his own behalf. And he stretches out his arms and he shows everybody in the courtroom who he really is. Man, you guys are not feeling me tonight. So you might be saying to yourself, wow, okay, well, you know, we talked about why didn't he just kill Satan at the very beginning, but you might be saying to yourself, if God is so good then, Dakota, why is the world so bad? We're going to talk about this. We're going to unpack this and make sense of this. Because there's a lot of people that's wondering this question. And, and they, they look at this, you know, there's this courtroom scene. And right now, we're the jury. We're looking at this. We're beholding this conflict. We have experienced the plaintiff. We all have fallen short of the glory of God, have we not? Amen. Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all experienced the plaintiff. But we all have to have an opportunity to experience the defendant. And see his case. And so, we have to be able to look at the defendant and give him a chance. So along our journey, sometimes we look at these things and we're saying, 
If, if this defendant is really so good, then how did this whole situation get so bad? Right? Uh-huh. Well, we get this question answered in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, notice it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Notice what kind of seed he sold? Good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and he went his way. Now let me express something to you here about wheat and tares, something you probably didn't know about wheat and tares. Some of you might be farmers or you might have dealt with this before, but let me express something to you about these. Wheat and tares are very, very different, but they're very, very similar in their early stages of growth. In fact, you cannot possibly tell the difference between a wheat and a tare until come harvest time, until it's fully matured. Now you know how you tell the difference between a wheat and a tare? Are you ready for this? The, the, the wheat bows low in humility by the fruit which it bears. Nobody? Nobody going to get excited about that? <laughs> Nobody? The tares stand tall and proud because they're fruitless. Amen? The tares have these little black seeds in them that if consumed cause you to be nauseous and cause confusion. Ooh, are you with me? And so, the, again, the, the wheat bows low in humility by the fruit which it bears. And so, you, when, you, when the blade sprung up, notice what it says, when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares. Even the Bible confirms this. You can't tell them apart until come harvest time. It says, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in thy field? Where did the tares come from? That's what they're asking. I thought you were a good God. I thought you were a good, you know, sower. Jesus is described as a sower. Are you with me, beloved? I thought you were good. Where did all these tares come from? That's what they're ultimately asking. God, if you're so good, why is the world so bad? Jesus answered this in five words. He said unto them, a what? An enemy hath done this. Notice, what did I say? Love demands what? Freedom, come on guys, love demands what? Freedom, freedom entails risk, and risk requires, what's that word? Responsibility. Does God take any responsibility for the tares that was sowed? No. What does he say? An enemy hath done this. But what does the devil have everybody believing about God? When a tornado comes through and wipes out places, and, and hurricanes blow through and kill multiple people, and all these natural disasters happen, you know, if you go to your insurance company, you know what they, they file that under? Acts of God. Wow. So, so the devil wants many people to believe these are, this is God's work. This is what God did. But beloved, what did Jesus say? An enemy hath done this. The servants then said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go gather them up? You want us to go take them out? We'll gather them up. We'll, we'll get our AK-47s and all of our boxes of ammunition and blow them all away. You want us to go get them up? Take care of them? Notice what Jesus says. But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat, what? with them. You see, beloved, the reason why you, you do that is because you are not the one that separates the wheat from the tares. The tares and the wheat actually share the same root. So there's only one who can divide them, and that's God. Can we say amen? amen. Judgment is not in our hands, it's in God's hands. And I praise God that He's the one who judges both the wicked and the righteous. It says, let both grow together into the harvest, and at the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into what? My barn. Listen, beloved, God wants a whole wheat church. <laughs> Amen. One of the greatest warnings God gives us in His Word is Matthew 24, 4. It's actually a warning that's repeated often, but we're not going to read all the Scriptures tonight. Notice in Matthew 24, 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man, what? Deceive you. That's why I told all of you, the beginning of tonight, I'll tell you every night afterwards, do not trust who? Me. Trust the Bible. Trust God's Word. There's too much at stake for you to put your trust into man. So Jesus says, Take heed that no man deceive you. I love this scripture here. Well, the scripture's about to pop up here. 1 Corinthians 3, 18. Let no man deceive himself. Ooh. Do you know you can deceive yourself? Do you know that? You can deceive yourself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. You think you're a smart fella? 
You think you're a smart woman. The Bible says, let you become a fool that you may be wise. What is the essence of deception? What's the, what's the fulcrum of deception? What, what's the details of that? I'll tell you, beloved. The essence of deception is that you are unaware that you are or have been deceived. You don't see someone walking around saying, hello, I'm deceived and I have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't see that. Why do you not see that? Because most people walk around thinking they know everything about everything, right? Whether it's politics, basketball, football, you name it. Are you with me? Does it matter? Most people think they know. And notice it says, let no man deceive himself. How do you deceive yourself? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above how many things? All things. So let me ask you a question after reading that. What's the most deceptive thing in the world? Mine and your heart. It's the most deceptive thing in the world. Mine and your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How you deceive yourself is by trusting even yourself. So when I tell you every night, don't trust me, I'm telling you that because I don't even trust me. No amen on that one. Okay, all right. All right, man, you guys are a tough crowd. All right, I don't even trust me. I don't trust me because I know, beloved, the only thing I can put my trust in to be sure is God's Word. It's the only thing that will not lead me astray. It's the only thing I can trust in and put my, my, let, let it be my guide and my shield through these troubling times that we're going through. The heart is deceitful above all things. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust yourself. We live in a society today where it says, follow your heart. Oh, beloved, don't follow that. It's the most wicked and desperately wicked and, 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 uh, and deceitful thing that there ever has been. Amen? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My friends, the only way you and I can be sure that we are not deceived, that, this, that the inception of deception that began with, in heaven and that has creeped down to planet earth, the only way you and I can be sure that we're not deceived is to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman, that we will not be ashamed in the day of His appearing, but that we can have smiles on our faces ready to meet our Savior. What do you say? Amen. Amen. As we talk about the beginning of this whole story with humanity, it reminds me of, of the gospel message. And in fact, I would submit to you that there is no passage so clear in all of Scripture that communicates the gospel as Genesis chapter 3. When you read Genesis 3, oh, my friends, you find the beautiful message of the gospel. You say, what's the gospel? It's a good message. It's what the word gospel means, a good message. You don't find a good message mostly anywhere else other than the, the, this garden experience. Think about it, think about it. Sin entered the world for humanity, this world that we're in today, beginning in a garden. But check this out. Jesus, our Savior, took our sin in a garden. Come on now. You see, Adam and Eve had sinned. And they go and they hide themselves. They, they, they try to hide behind. Guess what? They hide behind the trees of the garden. Oh, how that typifies salvation. You know, the only way you and I will ever be hid in the last days from the wrath of God is behind a tree. We gotta get behind a tree. But they sowed those fig leaves, remember that? They put on those fig leaves. Those fig leaves, and they said, oh, this will cover us up. All that shame and all that guilt and all the things they had ever experienced from their disobedience. Now they feel that. And they know those fig leaves aren't really doing it, which is why they're hiding in the first place. And so, God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the Bible says. He says, Adam, where are you? It wasn't because he didn't know where Adam was. No, this is omniscient, all-knowing God. He knew. He didn't ask Adam where you are because he didn't know. He asked Adam where are you because he wanted Adam to realize he was lost. He 
comes walking in the garden. He sees their fig leaves. And I could imagine like a child not knowing how to really solve the problem. They try themselves to cover up the, the, the result of their own sinful decisions. God says, let me just take that from you. I got something better for you that will cover all of your shame. Think about it. When you're naked, you feel shame, right? If you were naked right now, you would feel very shameful. God says, let me take all of that because it's not going to cover all of your nakedness. And let me give you something else. And you know what the Bible says that God gave them? Genesis 3.21. The first thing mankind ever made after creation, you know what it was? Fig leaves. First thing they ever made after creation. You know what the first thing God, the Creator, ever made after creation? The Bible says it's coats of skins. And listen, He clothed them. He clothed them in Genesis 3.21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of of skins and clothed them. Listen, beloved, why didn't Adam and Eve die that day? Well, some people say, oh, because a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day and no man ever lived to be a thousand years old. Well, that's true. It's a good application there, but that's not what that really means. They should have died that day. Why didn't they? Because God made coats of skins. And he clothed them. How do you make coats of skins? Something has to die. Right? Specifically an animal. What animal do you think died? A lamb. Somebody said it. A lamb. Revelation 13 verse 8 calls Jesus the lamb that was slain from where? the foundation of the world in Genesis. He's that lamb. And it took his death to cover their shame, to cover their guilt, to cover their mistakes. Do you know what another word, you know, we, we, we sing songs all the time, hide thou me. Hide thou me. You ever heard that song? We sing songs. Hide thyself in the cleft of the rock. Right? All throughout Scripture it talks about us being hid in Christ. We got to be hid in Him. What does that mean? We sing about it. Do we know what it means? Let me share with you, beloved, what it means. What is another name for animal skin? Come on, somebody. What's another name for animal skin? Hide. What did Jesus do when he covered Adam and Eve? He hid them with the hide of the lamb. They were in Christ. How did sin enter the world? It was through Adam and Eve partaking from the forbidden tree. They took from the tree that God told them not to take from. That's how they sinned from the beginning. Now check this out. What's the good news here though? The Bible says that God, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, becomes sin for humanity. How did they sin? They took from the what? The tree and sin infected humanity with a virus that went on and on and on. The Bible says that God became sin for you and me. He took all the sin that you've ever committed in your life from Adam's day until today on himself. And check this out. They took sin from the tree. Jesus takes your sin and my sin and he puts it in himself and he puts it back on the tree. Amen? And now Jesus has reversed the curse. 
whoever partook of the first tree would die. But now whoever partakes of this tree of Calvary will live forever. Can we say amen, beloved? Wow. Wow. What a marvelous love that is. That the Son of God would become the Son of Man. Wow. He would give all up all the glory of heaven, all of the majesty with His Father and the angelic host. The Son of God would be like you and I and become the Son of Man. You know what I call that? That's some reckless love. That is some reckless love. Because if he failed, he dies forever. If he sins one time, the wages of sin is death forever. Oh, that's some reckless love, wouldn't you say? I want you to think about that love. Our brother Tim sings this beautiful song.
Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. I hope that you believe that. But if you don't, keep coming. And I can promise you, by the end of this whole series, you will believe. I love Jesus. And I think when I think of his love, oh, how I don't understand it the way I want. But when I look at that reckless love that Tim just sang about, I want to understand more of it. What about you? So I encourage you to keep coming. The devil's going to try to do all that he can to keep you away. But guess what? As he just saying, God is going to chase you down. He will fight until you're found. But he needs you to yield. I pray that you will keep coming. Amen? If it's your desire to commit your life to Jesus, in the search of his word, and to get familiar with his word, to give him a chance, the Bible says, come and taste and see that the Lord, that he is good. I pray that you'll keep coming and keep giving God's word a taste, that you might have a craving for it every day. What do you say? Amen. If that's your desire, I want to invite you to stand as we close in prayer. Well, oh God, we thank you, Lord, for the reckless love that you have displayed upon Calvary's cross for us. What marvelous love that is. I pray, Lord, tonight that as we leave, we will never leave your presence. That, Lord, we will truly submit to the calling that you have on our life. That you, Lord, you are just yearning. Oh, God, you are longing for a relationship with us. I pray that every single person here that is watching now, Lord, that will have that relationship with you that you so desire. That intimacy, Lord, so close. And nothing can separate us from you. Anyone can see in the shape that she's in. That things are getting worse. This world is going down. I pray, Father, that you will give us your Holy Spirit. Bring us back each night refreshed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We just want to remind you that you are going to receive... Tonight, uh, our study guide on your way out called Did God Create the Devil? And uh, if you would like to have that study guide, just make sure that you get them on your way out the door tonight. Uh, we want to remind you, tomorrow night we will be back here at 6 o'clock for, uh, for a presentation titled A Metal Man Turned to Sand. And then at 7 p.m. we're going to be studying The Second Coming of Jesus Christ. So this is going to be amazing presentations we have ahead of us. We encourage you to keep coming. God bless you all and have a wonderful night.